On Monday, September 9th of 2014, an entire family was found murdered in their farmhouse. After finding a note that was left behind, it became very apparent about who did it. The biggest question is why? This is the twisted case of the Hunt family. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also staring contests. Just kidding. What you were looking at was a still image, but it's now a video. And I am not real. Or am I? But anyway... Today, we're going over the case of the Hunt family and what happened to them on that awful September night. So for our story, we're heading to Lockhart, New South Wales, Australia. Originally known as Green's Gunya in the 1850s because of a man named Mr. Green, and he was the earliest settler here and had a shop set up. It was officially changed to Lockhart in 1897, though. Nowadays, there's about 800-ish people who live here, and it seems to be a nice little town that has yearly festivals and events and a decent amount of things to do. One person that lived here, specifically on a family-run farm, was named Jeff Francis Hunt. Born in March of 1970 to John and Lynette Hunt, he was the second of four children, all of them being boys. They grew up on a family farm and seemed to be a pretty normal family. Jeff went to high school and was pretty liked, but had the interesting nickname of Dingle. This continued throughout his college years, where he would end up getting a degree in agricultural science, and then he went back home to work on his family farm with his brothers. Jeff was really good at tennis, soccer, and also golf. He loved tennis the most, though, and played it pretty much all of the time, and he was also an excellent water skier. Many people described him as being a great man who was easygoing, outgoing, and positive, and he also had a great sense of humor. Some people said that he was a perfectionist, but a decent and honest man. A childhood friend of Jeff's named Robert said that he was somewhat like a closed book, but always put a positive spin on everything. Meanwhile, Jeff's brother Ian had a much different way of looking at him. Ian said that Jeff was a very dominant and calculated person, that it was always Jeff's way or no way, that Jeff was extremely controlling to the point that there was zero reasoning with him about anything. I tend to believe that Jeff may have been one way to some people and a completely different way to others. Sometime in October of 1996, when he was 26 years old, he was spending his day at the Lockhart Picnic Race Club. This is a horse race meet that has an annual picnic where people can enjoy a day out. While Jeff was here, he ran into a woman named Kim Janine Blake. She was born in December of 1972 to Carrie and Heather Blake. Kim was one of two children, both girls, and she, like Jeff, grew up on a family farm, but in Tumba Rumba. This was pretty far away from Lockhart, about a two-hour drive or so. Kim had a pretty normal childhood, from what I could tell, and when she got to college, she studied at Wollongong University, eventually becoming a registered nurse. Kim loved cooking, gardening, water skiing, horse riding, and she had a ton of energy. Sometimes she would work triple shifts, and she really originally worked a ton. She was very generous and community-minded, and it's said that she really loved helping people. Well, anyway, Jeff and Kim hit it off very well. So well, in fact, that they became inseparable and ended up getting married in October of 2001. 
They'd go on to have three children, a boy named Fletcher, who was born in 2004, a girl named Mia, who was born in 2006, and a girl named Phoebe, who was born in 2008. The Hunt family was now all living at Watch Hill, which is a 3,000-acre property that's a few minutes away from Lockhart. It was one of the many properties that were owned by Jeff and his brother. Kim was very excited at the idea of one day building her dream home on the farm, and she even sold her house that she owned before Jeff to one day make this happen. But by 2009, Jeff and Kim's marriage started to have a bit of tension. Jeff had told some friends that things weren't going great and that he didn't know if him and Kim would make it to their 10th anniversary. It's said that Kim was hypercritical of Jeff, and this caused him to be very distressed. This same year, Jeff had been talking to his sister-in-law, Renee, about him and Kim's marriage issues, and he told her that he didn't care if he lived anymore. A pretty big telltale sign of some issues brewing many years before. The next year, in January of 2010, Kim saw a psychologist for symptoms of anxiety and depression. Before this, she was never diagnosed with any mental health issues, but the psychologist suggested that she needs to go on an antidepressant, so she got some from her doctors. Throughout this year, Kim met with her psychologist three times, and during the first visit, she said that Fletcher, her oldest child, and only boy was causing her grief. This was because he was somehow cruel to animals and aggressive. Kim also spoke about how the farm was in a drought and how she wasn't getting along very well with her sister, parents, and father-in-law. Her psychologist put her on a program of cognitive behavior therapy, relaxation strategies, and time management techniques. This same year, or about the middle of 2010, Jeff had told his brother that if he dies, he hopes Fletcher dies with him because he would hate for Fletcher to be trying to run the farm with Kim telling him what to do. A very, very alarming thing to be said. About two years would pass and something awful would happen. Kim was driving down the road when she was involved in a bad car accident on July 17th of 2012. Originally, she was not expected to survive, but she did. She suffered a severe brain injury and cervical fractures and was left with permanent physical disabilities. This included weakness of her entire right side and decreased strength and function of her right hand. Kim's super high energy levels turned to practically nothing and she had to sleep all the time. This was because if she didn't, she'd become very frustrated and angry, especially at Jeff and her oldest child, Fletcher. Kim stayed at the hospital for about seven months, and on February 22nd of 2013, she returned home having full care basically around the clock. She needed assistance for activities at her home, and, and this especially included taking care of the children. These workers would help her get the children ready for school, cook, and clean. Initially, Kim had a caretaker there 12 hours a day, seven days a week, but eventually it was cut down to five hours on weekdays from 3 to 8 p.m. and 12 hours on weekends. This same year, or 2012, one of Jeff's brothers left to run his own farm as a separate business. That brother was Ian, and as I said before, they already had a bit of tension. This caused some pretty big problems between the brothers, and Jeff became concerned about financial problems. Kim, after her accident, would become incredibly frustrated with her husband and her son. She really found Fletcher's behavior to be unbearable at this point, and by 2013, she had taken him to see her psychologist and a few other doctors. Fletcher was diagnosed with ADHD and he was given Ritalin. Meanwhile, Kim, who by now was still taking her antidepressants, 
had her dosage doubled in May of this year. In early June of 2013, at Jeff's request, the couple went to therapy together. A few days later, on June 6th, Kim went back to this therapist by herself, and she told him that on numerous occasions, she wished that she would have died in the car accident, and if she could, she'd take her own life. Kim told the therapist that she believed Jeff's brother defrauded the family business and that she was upset because she couldn't do anything she previously enjoyed doing, like water skiing. Kim also said that she had nothing to live for. About a week later, on June 14th, a telephone counselor called Kim because her case manager requested so. Kim had an entire team helping her because of the accident that was funded by the government. But during this conversation, Kim told the counselor that she had thought of taking her life in the past few weeks and that there were guns in the house. The counselor then called local authorities because of their protocols, and this same day, the police paid the Hunt family a visit. Kim told them that she was okay but due to safety precautions, the officers arranged for an ambulance to assess her. The officers also asked Jeff about the guns, and he took them to his gun safe. He showed them two rifles, a 22 caliber and a double-barrel 12-gauge shotgun. Jeff told police that Kim didn't have access to this safe, though, but the police took the guns anyway. A few weeks later, though, the officers ended up calling Jeff and told him that Kim wasn't a risk, and eventually his guns were returned to him. Kim's friends and family had noticed that her personality was a bit different because of her brain injury and that she lost her filter. She would be very mean and aggressive to Jeff and oftentimes publicly criticize him for many things. On June 21st of 2013, Kim went to a psychiatrist who noted that she had difficulties with angry outbursts, had a loss of empathy, and couldn't comprehend the impact of her anger. This psychiatrist wanted her to wean off antidepressants. Kim was very close with her cousin Jane their entire lives, and in mid-2013, Jane said that Kim was repeatedly going back to old issues. She said that these same issues consumed Kim and she could not find peace in her life. At times, she would work herself up into a frenzy, more often than not directed at Jeff. Kim was often out of control and depressed, although with occasional pockets of joy. Kim was eventually referred to a neuropsychiatrist and was put back on antidepressants and diagnosed with adjustment disorder with depressed mood because of the car accident. In September of 2013, Jeff went to see their couple's counselor and he told him that he had a lack of motivation, was avoiding people, and didn't enjoy being with his children even though they were the most important people to him. Jeff also said that his greatest fear was being on his own. Kim was still doing bad because of her car accident and she suffered greatly from this. She had balance issues and would regularly fall from this, and her right hand was still very messed up. On October 30th of 2013, she had to get surgery on her right hand. It didn't fix that much, but it helped a little bit. We'll fast forward some, and by April 17th of 2014, Kim was still seeing her neuropsychiatrist, and they said that she was progressing well, but feeling very unsupported by Jeff. She also returned to work around this time also. During the last week of June of 2014, the family spent the week with Kim's cousin, Jane. Kim told Jane that she had no love for Jeff and wasn't attracted to him anymore. A few months would go by and Kim's last appointment with her neuropsychiatrist was on September 3rd of 2014. The doctor said that Kim was functioning very well and her mood seemed to be stable. Kim said that she enjoyed going to work and her home life was great, that they were socializing more as a family. The doctor said that she should keep taking her mood stabilizing medication and her antidepressants. And like we said before, Kim was very harsh to Jeff. She would berate him a lot and 
be very, very critical of him. Most of the time, Jeff was able to just let it go, but over time, this behavior started to cause him deep distress. In many social situations, Kim started to say something about him while he was right there, and he usually didn't say anything, but would just go somewhere else. Their relationship was incredibly up and down, but it appeared to be mostly down. Another big thing to note is that the farming in this area required something called dry farming, where no irrigation was used, and according to other local farmers, from 2000 to 2014, it was incredibly difficult, and that September was the hardest time of the year. Since 2000, there were only two good years, and that was 2005 and 2010. In September of 2014, something absolutely terrible was about to happen. On Sunday, September 7th of 2014, pretty early in the day, Jeff went to a local hardware store and was to the workers that knew him in great spirits. He bought a lot of supplies and was chatting away completely normal. They said he talked about his future and how he was taking a proactive role in attending town council meetings. Later in the day, the Hunt's oldest child and only son, Fletcher, played a game of soccer. Jeff was one of the referees, and he ended up giving a point to his son's team while the scores were very close. This made some of the other team's families believe that Jeff was cheating, and it made them very angry. A pretty big argument ensued between Jeff and a parent, and the parent actually had to be dragged away. So it definitely got very heated. After the soccer game was over, the Hunt family, along with Jeff's brother Alan, his little family, and another couple and their children, all went to lunch at a local vineyard. When they were finished with lunch, all the families and children went to a nearby park so the kids could play. At about 5 p.m., they all went their separate ways. Nobody really seemed concerned with the way that Jeff or Kim were acting, and everything seemed to be normal. Apparently, Kim had made a few remarks aimed at Jeff, but everyone had just accepted that as being the new Kim since her crash. A day would go by, and on Monday, September 8th, Father's Day, the children all went to school. Kim went to her job at the hospital, and Jeff was helping a litter of pigs give birth all day at one of his brother's properties. His sister-in-law, Renee, was there, and she talked to him and thought that he sounded exceptionally happy, even though they spoke about some tough things. Jeff told her that he was worried about Fletcher's future, but Renee started to give him some examples of farmers with ADHD who've done well in life, and this made him feel a lot better. Jeff ended up talking on the phone to a friend named Craig during the afternoon about a soccer game. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Jeff then, at 4.13 p.m., called his buddy Luke to see if he was still available to play tennis on the 10th or two days later. This conversation was short-lived, but Jeff told Luke that he would make a tennis roster and send it out in a week or two. Back at the Hunt's home, Kim's support worker, Lorraine, arrived at the farm sometime around 2.30 to 3 p.m. Kim had already gotten home from work at this time, and she was cleaning up her garden using the riding lawnmower. Lorraine said hi, and then she went inside to start cleaning and getting food ready. Around 3.45 p.m., Kim went to the front gate of their property and got the kids off the school bus. They all had some tea, and then Kim helped their son Fletcher with his homework. He told her that some children at school teased him about what happened with his dad the day before, and they started calling him something very rude that rhymed with his last name, Hunt. The children were also saying that Fletcher's father was a cheater. Jeff had gotten home around 5 p.m. and then wrapped some Father's Day presents for his dad. Jeff then took the children to his parents' house not too far away in Lockhart. His father, John, said that Jeff appeared no different than any other time and was talking to them and appeared happy. 
Lynette, his mother, had a completely different outlook to Jeff. She said that he was less happy than usual, and when he and their grandchildren left at about 6 p.m., she told John that Jeff had no smiles that day. John replied by saying, no, he hasn't smiled for a week. While Jeff and the children were at his parents' house, his wife Kim and her caretaker Lorraine went to a neighbor's property that Kim had the duty of looking after while her neighbors went away. Jeff and the children eventually made it back home, and so Jeff decided to prepare some dinner and give it to the children. Kim and Lorraine got home, and Kim didn't like what Jeff made for dinner, and so she started to get angry at him. Kim eventually stormed out of the house, and Lorraine followed her, trying to calm her down. She then went on a rant about how Jeff was lazy, and that her brother-in-law, or Jeff's brother, Ian, stole money from their family trust and a bunch of other things. Eventually, Kim and Lorraine went back inside, and by this point, the children were all taking their nightly baths and in pajamas. Jeff then made the school lunches for the kids for the next day. Kim and Lorraine were in the other room. Lorraine asked Kim if Jeff was depressed because he seemed quieter than usual. Kim then started to berate him again and tell Lorraine that she was angry at him because he played golf on Saturday and left her to care for the children. A bit of time would pass, and it was now 7 p.m., and all the children were watching their favorite TV show while Jeff was on the sofa in the same room. Kim and Lorraine were at the dining table, which was also in the same room, and Kim continued to say things about Jeff and began to complain once again to Lorraine, saying that he was lazy and does nothing. Lorraine then did a few more things around the house and said goodbye to all the children and Jeff and Kim. Jeff said to her, goodbye, Lainey. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Lorraine said that there was so much tension in the house that night that you could have cut the air with a knife. 30 minutes later or so, at about 7.30 p.m., Jeff spoke on the phone with his brother, and it was just a normal catch-up call. Jeff's brother said that he didn't seem inclined to want to continue the conversation, and he said he sounded like he had to go and was rushed talking. This phone call only lasted for about three minutes. The next day, on September 9th of 2014, Lorraine, Kim's caretaker, went to the Watch Hill Farm at about 2.45 p.m. She was kind of surprised because Kim's car was in the driveway and Kim was supposed to be picking up her son from cricket practice after school. The family's dog, Ellie, was barking very loud and running back and forth. Lorraine thought to herself that something seemed off here, and so she started to head towards the back door of the home, which was used as the main entrance. While walking, Lorraine saw Kim lying on the pathway with a blue jacket over her head. Shocked, she ran over to Kim because she thought she fell as she typically would, but this time was much different. Lorraine lifted the jacket off of her head and saw a ton of blood. Immediately, she ran inside and called triple zero or 911 in Australia, and the call came in at 2.51 p.m. While on the phone, Lorraine walked back outside to Kim and realized that there wasn't just one jacket covering her, but two, and that they were Jeff's work jackets that usually hung in the laundry room. Lorraine then noticed a shell casing on the ground nearby and realized that Kim had been shot and was dead. While still on the phone with the operator, Lorraine went back into the house and, and noticed a handwritten note on the dining room table and looked out the window and saw Jeff's car parked next to the family's dam. By about 3.04 p.m., ambulances arrived and confirmed that Kim was dead. They kinda walked inside of the house, but it was in complete darkness with the blinds closed. One of the first responders in the ambulance noticed a shotgun shell on the hallway floor, and right then and there, I believe that they knew something even worse happened. The first responders then left the house and waited for the police to arrive. Lorraine then went up front to not only wait for the police, 
but to wait for the Hunt family's children that were supposed to be on the school bus. Lorraine was worried about them and didn't want them to see what happened to their mother. The police eventually arrived and set up post and tried to understand what had happened. Before they entered the property, they called the children's school and asked if the children were there. Unfortunately, they were not at school that day. The police officers then went over to the farm's dam where Jeff's car was at. They found the keys and the ignition with shotgun shells in the front seat, but Jeff was nowhere to be found. Around 4.30 p.m., the officers then went into the house and found all three children dead in their bedrooms. All of them died by a single gunshot wound to the head. Police concluded that there were zero signs of forced entry and that two of the children were asleep while they were shot. One was wide awake and sitting up against the wall on her pillow. So, so sad. The question now was, where was Jeff and what happened? Well, the next day on September 10th, police divers searched the dam that was on the farm and they found Jeff several feet below the water with a shotgun right near him. He too died of a gunshot wound, but this was self-inflicted. It was quickly realized that Jeff was the one responsible for everything. He had left a very small note behind that said only, I am sorry, it's all my fault, totally mine. That's it, that is all he wrote. Jeff Hunt murdered his entire family that night, and for what exactly? Well, an autopsy was done, and so was a psychological autopsy. The second one was done by a senior forensic psychologist named Dr. Sarah Yule. Dr. Yule concluded that Jeff first killed Kim, then Fletcher, then Mia, then Phoebe, and finally himself. Dr. Yule believes that Jeff most likely experienced depressive symptoms over time that along with his tendency to keep his emotions bottled in eventually led to his decision to murder his family. Dr. Yule said that his marital and family stressors, including Kim's permanent injuries, likely contributed to a feeling of hopelessness for the future. She said that in this case, it appears that Jeff could not possibly live without his children, and he didn't want to separate from Kim. Dr. Yule said that the children were most likely killed because Jeff believed they couldn't cope without him, and that he may have believed killing Kim would end her misery. She also said that Jeff may have felt like he got into a repetitive cycle of abuse from his wife that he could never escape due to her disabilities. So basically, the conclusion is that Jeff murdered his entire family because he wanted to die himself, but felt that his family couldn't live without him. Why did it happen on this night if Jeff appeared to be okay, if most things appeared to be okay? Well, people who do end their own lives and their families' lives many times act on impulse. And for some reason, this night, he must have felt like he just couldn't go on and that nothing was going to get better. It was also Father's Day, and it's unclear as to how his children were treating him, but we know that his wife was not treating him very good. Their oldest, the boy Fletcher, was being bullied at school this day because of Jeff. But still, no, just no. Jeff Hunt did one of the worst things imaginable, one of the literal worst crimes. Whatever his reasoning may have been, it will never, ever be good enough. No matter what you're going through, there is zero excuse to murder your innocent children or wife. It's incredibly selfish and just downright awful. It's also pretty unclear as to if Jeff ever had these type of feelings or thoughts before. Apparently, he most likely just snapped, but he could also have been planning this. We do know that his father said that he stopped smiling a week before. Still, Jeff Hunt may have been a great father, friend, and brother or son, but he was still deep down pure evil. And yes, it's not right that Kim did berate him the way that she did, but she did have an excuse. Phoebe Amelia Hunt was six years old and born in 2008. 
She was considered to be very happy and talked loudly. This year, or 2014, was her first year in school. She was the youngest member of the family, but apparently the most bossy. Phoebe had a natural ability for sports and was already learning how to water ski. Mia Isabel Hunt was eight years old and born in 2006. And she was very quiet. She suffered from anxiety from when Kim went into the hospital, but was starting to do okay. Mia enjoyed reading and her own company and oftentimes would do Fletcher's homework for him. She loved to nurture others and enjoyed learning. Her creative side was said to have came out, especially in the kitchen, and she enjoyed music and excelled at sports, especially netball and tennis. Fletcher Austin Hunt was 10 years old and born in 2004 and was a loud child with a lot of energy. He was said to be sometimes challenging, but liked soccer and riding his bike. He just upgraded to a full-sized one. Fletcher liked to jump ramps that he made on the family's property. He was a great athlete, and in one of his games at the age of 10, playing in the 14 under division, he managed to kick five goals. Kim Janine Hunt was 41 years old, and she had a great energy to her. She put in a lot of effort into everything she did and was a skilled nurse, a great chef, a gardener, and she loved sports. Kim was considered to be a generous soul who gave so much to everyone around her. She worked hard to overcome such a terrible car accident and in two years really was making some progress according to her friends and doctors. This entire family is deeply missed and remembered and what happened to these innocent souls on this night was awful. I hope that they're all resting peacefully and that their families have been able to find a bit of peace. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. Another thing is that recently I started an all-exclusive Patreon. Here, you're given the choice of three tiers, and the last one allows for a Patreon-only video that's uncensored. That and the second tier allow you to have your name at the end of each High Time Crime video. This is just in case you want to support me a little further. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.